Television is not the truth. Television is a goddamn amusement park. Television is a circus, a carnival, a traveling troupe of acrobats, storytellers, dancers, singers, jugglers, sideshow freaks, lion tamers, and football players. We're in the boredom killing business. So turn off your television sets, turn them off now, turn them off right now, turn them off and leave them off. Turn them off right in the middle of the sentence I'm speaking to you now. Turn them off! Welcome to TLB TV, Eradicating Programmed Ignorance. And as everybody knows, this is a show we do when we've got a special cause, a special show, or a special individual. Today, the conversation is going to be between <clears throat> Greg Ford, who everybody should know who he is by now. He's a phenomenal part of the Liberty Beacon Project, a great contributor, and of course, my absolutely lovely and highly intelligent co-host, Rebecca Mahan. Today, we're going to be talking about something <clears throat> that leads, um, well, it builds on one of the shows we've already done, actually several of the shows we've done. And both of those shows <clears throat> included uh, Greg. And uh, during those shows, we discussed torture, <clears throat> we discussed assassination, we discussed um, prisons in war zones, and we discussed um, the political ramifications of these issues. <clears throat> today, this was brought to my attention, well, not today, but it was brought to my attention by Greg, um, that there is something happening in Washington, T.C. by our brand new POTUS. And basically what we're talking about is the Trump administration is preparing, um, putting together a sweeping executive order that would clear the way for the CIA to reopen, or we will see because as the New York Times article says, it's not exactly sure this will lead to this, but it is an opening for and a possibility of reopening some of these overseas black site prisons, like those that were um, uh, where, where individuals were detained and tortured uh, due to being suspected terrorists or terrorists before um, the former administration shut them down. Now, <clears throat> President Trump's three page draft order titled detention and inauguration excuse me an interrogation of enemy combatants is the draft and this is um what the executive order will pertain to look <clears throat> we all know that politics is very deeply ingrained in this <clears throat> we all know <clears throat> or anybody who served in the military or anybody who's done as much research and written as many articles and done shows on this topic as I have, especially people like Greg <clears throat> who spent their life in either intelligence or counterintelligence and even Rebecca who is ex-military herself. We do know <clears throat> that torture is explicitly forbidden via the Geneva Convention, but there are ways around this and these elitists do everything within their power to find these ways and to redefine what we might be call what we might call terror to something that may be or may sound a whole lot less menacing like in you know enhanced interrogation um <clears throat> so we're going to get into that a little bit more today um first i want to bring in rebecca and rebecca i know that that this is very interesting for you as well and um, I'll let you bring Greg into the show, but please tell me what you see either disturbing or, I don't know. Yeah, I guess disturbing would be the best way to explain this. How do you see this as possibly disturbing? Well, I think that there's some issues in the way that the possible interrogation is being described as, but I am going to save and hold some of my thoughts the questions that I have for Greg, because Greg has some firsthand knowledge that I think will really bring to the surface some of the issues that need to be addressed, and then we can move from there. 
uh, being prior military, prior law enforcement, I will have some questions as boundary specifics and uh, why not? Why, why would we not have certain things? And then why would we? So those are some things, Greg, that I'm just sort of uh, laying a foundation for in your mind as you begin to broach the subject, uh, hopefully in depth, in a more definitive way for what's going on. Because I think those viewers that are hearing about this, if they haven't followed it before, are questioning, well, is this something that has gone on for a long time? How in depth was in it? Was it? Were there boundaries that the U.S. has? What about the G Geneva Convention? Um, other countries are using torture. Why can't we? There's a lot of things that our viewers are going to have questions. And I think more importantly from coming anywhere from where I sit, it's going to be Greg bringing it up to the surface and then we can uh, delve in a little bit further. So without any further ado, we have Greg Ford with us today. Welcome, Greg. Uh, thank you, Rebecca. All right. It's always a pleasure to be here. Uh, but th this was basically an emergency show. Uh, while, you, while you were providing the introduction, Rebecca, I just received a message stating that Washington now, and I have a strong feeling it's because of these shows that we've been doing, including the show with Janice Karpinski, General Karpinski, uh, that Donald Trump now, the president, POTUS, has decided to back off this issue of the Copper Green program, re-energizing this program. I have a very strong feeling that they took they took a look at the court cases, including mine. Mine is the leading court case because I am the only living, surviving member of the rendition program and Copper Green. Me alone. Greg, I'd like, I'd like to get into that further, but for viewers who are tuning in for the first time and may not be familiar with Copper Green, can you elaborate a little bit about what that is? Yes. Back in, in the 90s, uh, uh, this was on King Khalid Air Base in Saudi Arabia. Uh, the powers that be, as in Donald Rumsfeld, Dick Cheney, and the president at the time, George H.W. Bush, des decided that they needed to get together and make uh, and take the most advantage of something that they really wanted to utilize to strip the U.S. citizens of their basic rights. And, and what that amounted to was basically torture, all right? Uh, quite often, torture is a psychological program just designed to terrorize. It, by, the time, by the time a operation, military operation, gets a hold of somebody, quite often the, the information is perishable. But in the meantime, Everybody that, that is a victim of torture is basically destroyed and has terrorized the communities you know, to such a point that either the communities overreact, and, and like we saw with Iraq, uh, there was no insurgency until the information that, that their citizens, their people, their loved ones, their children were being tortured in Iraq at Abu Ghraib prison. So, what happened at, at the uh, King Khalid Air Base? Okay, in Saudi Arabia is yes, they had a test bed program, and this was ordered. This was ordered uh, at at the direction of George H. W. Bush, Dick Cheney, Donald Rumsfeld, and Paul Wolfowitz. Uh, the program basically showed that no torture is really no good, you know, for doing your homework in the intelligence field, but it does a lot of other things. Okay, and First of all, it terrorizes the country that you're in. It terrorizes the people that you're fighting against. <coughs> and it also <coughs> sets, the, sets the tempo for dismantling U.S. citizens' rights. As a result of Copper Green, we have a situation right now <coughs> where the President of the United States 
yes, now the president and uh, former President Obama could order the torture of any U.S. citizen, any U.S. citizen that they want. They don't have to explain it. They don't have to give instructions. They don't have to justify it in the judicial system, which has always protected the U.S. citizens of this country. They don't have to anymore, all in the name of fighting, quote, terrorism. All right. right. Let me let me let me jump in here for a second, please. And you take a swig of water before you choke on us. Listen, <clears throat> we already have this country. OK, already has um, the uh, ability or our government to uh, indefinitely detain us. This country, um, our government already <clears throat> believes it can ex exercise the right to assassinate us without due process. But let's talk about something. Let me amplify something that you brought up that I think is a very, very important point. <clears throat> and then <clears throat> you can continue right on where you left off. Because what most people don't understand, if you go back to the 1950s, okay, <clears throat> in Iran, okay, there was no insurgency. There was no terrorism against America or just about anybody on the planet. There was a little bit because the Brits had been a little bit too forceful in some of the countries they were occupying, but there was no terrorism against the United States of America. Yet we go in in the 1950s and we stick our nose into the Iranian government and what do we do? <clears throat> we help the Shah of Iran overthrow a duly elected or a publicly wished for government and we install a puppet. From that day forward, we have seen a steadily increasing incidence or the rise of terrorism against the United States. If you take the first Gulf War, if you take the second Gulf War, yeah, or, or, or uh, you take the uh, attack on Iraq, the attack on uh, Afghanistan, what we're doing in Sudan, what we've done in Libya, what we're doing in Syria. I don't know about you, and I've written many articles about this, but if you fly over my house and drop a bomb while I'm at the market and I come home and find my wife and kids dead, you have made an enemy for life. We have manufactured a steadily increasing number of terrorists across the world who wish harm on the United States. We have literally manufactured more hate towards our country and more terrorists hell bent on killing Americans via our own mechanisms than anything else can be blamed on. And we go back to the 1950s to prove this. So when you say <clears throat> that we're via the mechanism of torture, we're terrorizing. We're striking fear into these communities. And what are we doing? We are amplifying their wish to strike back at who? At America. So I really, really understand what you're saying. I wanted the audience to understand why you said that. And for anybody who doubts anything I say, just look at history. It is blatantly self-explanatory. Please continue, Greg. Uh, yes, the, the Iranians ended up getting a U.S.-sponsored puppet and an uh, intelligence uh, organization called SAVAC. The SAVAC was one of the most ferocious groups ever, and it was completely directed, organized, trained, supplied intelligence by the CIA. So when you say the Middle East doesn't like the way we, we do things, that is largely correct. Yes, they don't like being tortured. They don't like having their loved ones tortured to death. They don't like having their children tortured to death, and especially in front of them. They don't like so, bombings, drone strikes, missile hits, snipers. They don't like any of this. They don't like any of it, period. And, and then you go to Iraq, who had a leader since 1959. 1959, was a CIA employee, and his name was called Saddam Hussein, all right? And he took his orders from the CIA and George H.W. Bush, all right? The, uh, the inventor and leader of today's modern the terrorism and torture, all right? Uh, who's, it, by the way, in the hospital currently, okay? So, uh, as a result, though, I, myself, being in Iraq, had to deal with the issues of, of, of Iraqis and, and Saudis and Yemeni 
uh, all being terrorized because of what we were doing, all right? They had been living with uh, dictators and, uh, and had made them very angry over a period of time. And so what we have now is a program that hardly anyone knows about, but it's finally getting out, thanks to people like myself and Seymour Hirsch, <clears throat> that this program is called Copper Green. And one thing that the Bush administration learned is that they can make money, they can make revenues. <clears throat> you know, uh, let's face it, the CIA is losing revenues because they can't freely smuggle cocaine in anymore into the United States like they used to, all right? They weren't called the Cocaine Importation Agency for nothing, so they have to uh, invent or create something that can create the same kind of revenues, provide the same revenues that they had when Hillary Clinton and her husband were providing imp importation uh, capacity from the Caribbean, from the Co uh, Columbia, to the United States. It's called MENA, Mena Arkansas. Not can too I far ask you a question? Let me, let, me, let me ask you, oh yeah, you had to bring that up. <laughs> let me ask you a question, <clears throat> because again, something that I've done a lot of research on and written several articles on, uh, the Taliban had just about eradicated the poppy fields in Afghanistan prior to the U.S. invasion. And this is not a guess. This is a fact, okay? Today, <clears throat> they have the highest level and the most productive poppy fields in the history of Afghanistan. There are U.S. troops, I literally have pictures of this, that are patrolling these poppy fields to ensure that they stay safe, stay safe that nobody comes in and raids the fields or nobody burns the fields or whatever. So now what we have, and you've got to understand that I understand that a lot of this is driven via the CIA, we have American military forces protecting the poppy fields, which provide the world's about 80% of this planet's heroin. And we have heroin addiction at an epidemic level in the United States and most of the free world. Is this an accident, Greg? No, it's not. Given that most of those troops are the, from the group Blackwater, the Blackwater Mercenary Group, which, strangely enough, was only, it wasn't licensed to operate under the Department of Defense. It operates under our State Department, all right? That's why they can then torture anybody they want. That's why they can set up torture uh, centers. That's why they can massacre anybody they want. It's because they operated, got received their charter under the State Department. And who was running the State Department? Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton was running the State Department. And strangely enough, there's nothing like being tortured yourself to make you take an interest in something like torture, and which I can personally testify to. And I found out that yes, Hillary Clinton and her husband, Bill Clinton, okay, were the first to sign off on the charter for the United States government to go ahead and develop torture as a tool of state policy. So yes, it was Hillary Clinton who brought in uh, the mercenary group Blackwater, and they also brought in the capability of developing uh, massive secondary uh, drug revenue and production, and they also brought in torture. It's an, a real overachieving couple, I can say about the Clintons. And then, okay, from there, we have a situation where our, our now president has said, and I just reviewed it last night in the debates, he was going to form a commission to review what Hillary Clinton had done when, when she was Secretary of State to find out what crimes were committed. Well, I just named several right there, all right? But the thing is, is that, yes, if that is exposed, that revenue is exposed, the, a the agency does not, the agency does not have, okay, that revenue, that, uh, that untaxed, undeclared revenue that it's always had. And so hence, uh, there's the attempt right now to re-energize the Copper Green program, which is uh, registered to at least, I believe you said, Roger, 170 countries, I know of 127 countries where 
a revenue process is created by sending <coughs> each country's each country's troublemakers <coughs> as identified by the government and for a fee they can be sent to places like Morocco, Poland, Hungary, uh, Egypt, <coughs> and it used to be surprisingly Syria, Libya, okay, all those countries. So well, as, you're saying you're saying 127 countries. I'm saying 170 countries, either overtly or covertly, whereas the government of a specific country may not even be aware of, of, of covert uh, special forces. But you needed, you wanted to say something. Why don't you jump in there, Rebecca? Well, I'm wondering what kind of torture specifically that you're referring to. Okay, what kind of tortures did I have to treat for the effects of when I was the medic attached to my group at... at which was assigned to Abu Ghraib prison? Is if that what you're you asking? If you're not at liberty to discuss that with your case right now, that's fine. But maybe you could just describe if it's the same as what has been coming out in the media, waterboarding, hooding, naked torture, those kinds of things. Well, first of all, you mentioned waterboarding. Dogs. <clears throat> what? Oh, yes, dogs too. Okay. Well, there's nothing like being torn to pieces by dogs to get it get uh, some intel usable intelligence from somebody. Uh, the, the other evening, I saw The World According to Dick Cheney, and there were people being torn to pieces by dogs at Abu Ghraib. Gee, imagine that. And Dick Cheney said himself that that was the beginning of the end for the Bush administration. But yes, when I was in Iraq, yes, our headquarters was Abu Ghraib, and, and, and to make and, and I'll, I'll point it right to my legal case right now. Uh, I had 53, 53 patients that I had to treat from uh, the result of this kinder and gentler interrogation practice. And virtually all of them at one point still, still uh, uh, bothers me to the is that I had to fix them so they could be uh, retortured and then shipped at the point. This point was in Samara, the city of Samara, okay, where all this insurgency began. That uh, I had to fix them, repair them, okay. These are prisoners, so they could be really, really interrogated in Abu Ghraib prison. Let me, okay, so let me jump in here for one second, and then I'll pass it over to you, Rebecca, because I need everybody in the audience listening to this, because <clears throat> we have so much clickbait <clears throat> on the internet today. We have so much where people just sensationalize things so that people will go to and listen to your shows or click on your website so you can get ad revenue. You need to understand that what Gregory is saying is not only true, but if you watch last week's show and probably the show we're going to do the first week of February, you can hear General Karpinski is saying exactly the same thing Greg is saying, not only that, but validifying what Greg's saying because Greg and, and General Karpinski were there at the same time. They observed the same things. They went through the same, well, maybe not the same scenario. She wasn't tortured, Greg was. But for anybody who believes that Greg is sensationalizing anything or that pulling this stuff out of his proverbial ass, nothing could be further from the truth. What you're hearing, if it's shocking you or you're pushing it aside because you think it's sensationalizing, you're wrong. Go ahead, Rebecca. So correct me if I'm wrong, but hasn't there been cases that have come out over the years that have photographs of military members providing some of these torture techniques and actually having been court-martialed from that? <clears throat> well, it is, yes, partially true, all right? Always remember, when you deal with the American government and you deal with the military, you're dealing with bureaucracies. And the first rule in a bureaucracy is always protect the bureaucracy first. So. The CIA is a bureaucracy first and an intelligence agency second, all right? So in this case, you ask about waterboarding. Well, strange, strangely, is yes, it was used, okay, no questions about it, <clears throat> but now it's providing the basis of legal defense for Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, probably one of the most famous terrorists 
in our custody. And, and, and until you see waterboarding and then you hear some imbecile like Dick Cheney say it's a, a, no, a no brainer and, and you see the results, anybody listening and the sound of my voice in your audience will say that's the most nauseating, disgusting thing I've ever seen. We should not be doing it, all right? When they talk about it, it's abstract. When you see it and have to treat the medical condition for it and what results, you will never, ever condone waterboarding, ever in your life. Now, in this well, case- let me, let me stop you right there, Greg, because there, there's a, a point that you're making here that sometimes we, fail to remember, and that is because we are America, not only do we do the necessary steps it takes to protect our country, but whatever we do in its wake, we treat those things. So for those who are being tortured, they are coming to you and you are then treating them. Yes, and, and by the way, uh, yes, there was a presidential and a White House investigation into Abu Ghraib prison. And other than me, they are recommending the full prosecution of every single psychologist, CIA psychologist that was there, every nurse, every doctor. All right. That's how, that's how in the real world, how brutal this whole process is. But how many of the contractors, Greg? I mean, we, in our last show, we discussed the fact, because I was a, a contractor for the DOD. I understand the relationship there. I understand the isolation where we don't have as much culpability as somebody in the military may. So how much of this was perpetrated via contractors? And what's their culpability in this? Please go into that because that's a can of worms most people don't understand, but I have a feeling you and I probably understand that better than most people do. Well, I'll put it this way. Every single one of those kids that went to prison with all those pictures, okay, uh, General Karpinski and I had a long talk about this after the show last time, okay? All they did were follow instructions, okay? But they, but they were... They actually had their picture taken. You know, that was, that was the whole caveat to this story, is they had their picture taken. And as, as soon as that happened, and it was released on 60 Minutes, they were doomed, all right? They had a, they had a president come out and say, yeah, we have some bad apples in this bunch. He, he wasn't mentioning the fact that he actually wrote the memo ordering our intelligence group to torture people. He, did, he forgot to mention that. But the thing was, that was an embarrassment. It was an embarrassment that exposed Copper Green, okay? The existence of Copper Green, the international global torture program that the Bush family engineered and, and uh, Dick Cheney and Donald Rumsfeld put together, okay? Okay, That's what so the real quick, for those viewers who uh, may be looking at this from a different angle, the question might come up that, other countries will use torture ter interrogation techniques on our own military if they are caught. What would be the difference between our country doing the same thing? Well, I confirmed what I, I know are facts, <clears throat> is that yes, as a result of Abu Ghraib, not one single American prisoner, okay, soldier taken prisoner, was returned. Uh, to uh, the American side with evidence of, without evidence of torture, okay? Yes, they had been tortured and virtually all of them had been decapitated as a result of what we did in Abu Ghraib, okay? So we should notify our soldiers, yes, the next time they go into a war, this is what could happen to you because your own side is behaving this way. I can't think of too many people that would want to join an organization like that. So, so I still need you to tie in the contractors here because that's a big segment of what we're discussing. And that's a big, you know, they get a lot of money for this. Well, that's, that's a very gray area. And I pointed out, what was it? Uh, Mitchell and Richards, I believe, were the two CIA contractors that are in court right now. And... And this, yes, they did. When they torture people 
in calling it enhanced interrogation techniques, they get four times the normal hourly fee that a psychologist gets. So it's big business to go ahead and torture. And a hell of a lot more than that foot soldier gets. Huh. Yeah, I, I can testify for that. Yes, I can testify for both being tortured. Uh, and I know I was a contractor. And being, <laughs> and being a government employee and, and a U.S. citizen. We will mention that, a U.S. citizen too. So yes, uh, the contractors were there. They were brutalizing people because it pays big bucks. All right. And if you don't torture, okay, in this situation, you don't make big bucks. It's just that simple. All right. And so all those, all those contractors, none of them were held accountable. Okay. Because they operated under a different set of regulations and values. So uh, as a result, uh, it, it was a stunning success. Abu Ghraib was because of this. It, pro it proved to be ground zero for Copper Green, and it expanded logarithmically. The program has expanded to, as you say, 170 countries, and I tend to believe that. And it, it provides revenue that can't be quantified with, with uh, and for the agency especially, and that is all tax-free, unaccountable. So it's a great deal for some organizations. And that's why 170 countries have signed up to send their, bad, their troublemakers, their bad boys, and provide the U.S. government with a great form of revenue. And, and also, it is supporting, let's see, seven, seven wars. The U.S. citizens are right now are supporting seven wars that are unknown, unrecorded, okay? And we're soon to have three more wars going on, which are the direct benefits of copper green, okay? Now, yes, there were been, have been some problems. Several, several countries are, have been extremely upset with the result of copper green showing up on their doorstep and, and doing these hideous things to people, okay? You know, it, for example, if you want somebody tortured twice a day, it's for a fee. That's the American way, of course. For a fee, he can be tortured twice a day. And if you are tired of supporting him, you know, and you're the country or the president, for a fee, they can cut him up into little pieces and he will never be seen again. That prisoner will never be seen again, ever, without a trace, all right? So th this is the American way. This is what it has spawned, all right, is a bloodthirsty global uh, monster that isn't that far away from doing the same thing to American citizens. Well, right. hold on a minute, hold on a minute, because <clears throat> we fought a world war because of an individual who supposedly was doing some of the same things we're describing right here. We saw millions die during World War II. A massive amount of U.S. young American males die during World War II for exactly these same reasons. I, I've asked this question in at least a half a dozen articles I've written. When did we become what we hate most? Now, <clears throat> let me qualify that, okay? I'm not looking at you who are watching this show and saying this is your fault. I'm not looking at you and saying it's your fault. What I am saying is this is what our government is doing. They represent us. They speak for us. They do this in our names. And if by eradicating the programmed ignorance you all have in being totally unaware that this is being done in your name, if once you know, you still decide to do nothing, what makes you any better than that cretin who's giving the order for these people to be tortured? You are no better than they are. You have a defense as long as you are ignorant. When we dispel that ignorance, it is up to you to open your damn mouth. Have I got that right, Rebecca? Well, what I'm hearing is that there is two issues here. And one is that by having that done or being reinstituted, we're jeopardizing our own men and women who are currently out there serving our country. And the second is that 
that it allows an opportunity for it to be done on citizens here in the United States. Is this correct? Absolutely. There's no question about it. <clears throat> like I say, I'm, I'm a person that was, when I stood up, did the right thing, the legal requirement in my situation, I've told your listeners and I've told you folks, look, this is what happened. I was strapped to a stretcher and tortured. Okay, it's just that simple. They tortured me to find out who I had contacted. That's what they really wanted to know, who I had contacted. And, and any, anyone can read my case, it's quite simply, in my legal case. They can look it up in federal court, all right? 14-15050 will, uh, will completely recall this entire event, including some other extremely embarrassing facts about the government and this case, all right? Was, but, this, common, was this common ground amongst medics and um, those that were treating patients that had been subjected to torture, or um, was this an idle, isolated case in reference to you specifically? Uh, let me see. Okay, well, as far as I know. Out, you stepped outside of the norms you discovered <clears throat> some weapons in a bunker by the Carlisle Group. I mean, we went over this in one of our shows, and that's one of the things they didn't like at all, was that you had knowledge that maybe you weren't supposed to have, and how were you going to use this knowledge? So that, I, how much did that actually factor into the way you were treated, as well as who you contacted as far as the torture goes, or who you contacted, um, because your job, wasn't it, was to go out and make contacts amongst the civilian population? Yes, I was a human intelligence operative, okay, for the U.S. government. Our job was to go out and, and first of all, look for things that were a threat, okay, uh, a threat to the, uh, what they call it, force protection, a threat to the force. All right, so, uh, and we had been trained, we had been given specific evidence showing uh, certain types of systems, uh, like uh, bomb making systems and so forth, and we're told, look for these systems. Well, I didn't expect it to happen, but, but what happened was, is I recruited the commander of the fighter bomber wing that dropped weapons of mass destruction on the Kurds in the, in the Anfal campaign, and in, and in Kurdistan, they probably killed 200,000 people. Those weapons of mass destruction that were produced by the Carlisle Group, all right? And the Carlisle Group had the sitting president of the United States at that moment, at that moment, which was George W. Bush, on the board of directors. And the Carlisle Group had been founded and, and completely structured by his father, George H. W. Bush, to take advantage of the fact that George H.W. Bush could have removed weapons of mass destruction from the world through the SALT agreements and chose not only not to uh, do away with these hideous weapons, but also to make money. Okay, I guess that's the American way, but to make money off these hideous weapons, and he did it, all right? He did exactly that. These weapons uh, were actually in cases with the bills of lading and transportation strapped, uh, taped to the outside of the case, and it gave the exact orders. Who gave the orders? The, the ship, the U.S. ship that carried these weapons to Iraq, and where these weapons were reconfigured and, and structured, all right? It was the Bush family, folks. I don't need to make it any simpler, but a very strange thing happened um, on the way to the church is, on the day that I found those weapons, <coughs> excuse me, and turned them over to my commander <coughs> with, a, with a very interesting sideways look he gave me, uh, because I didn't realize that my commander was in the process of applying for a job with the Carlisle Group, okay? In fact, two of the defendants in my case are now working for the Carlisle Group, it was a very interesting situation because CNN, which was less than 100 yards away in Balad, no one ever notified them. No one was allowed to notify them. 
and our Pentagon, when they were notified that these weapons had turned up, they said, destroy these weapons within hours, within five hours. Hence, the British were notified to come in with their arc light furnace and destroy these weapons. Yes, and we do have footage on the entire destruction process. So, yeah, this is something. In, now, if I'm confused, please tell me, because I thought that we were supposed to go to Iraq and find weapons of mass destruction. Well, didn't we find those weapons of mass destruction? Except they weren't the right kind of weapons of mass destruction. They had not an embarrassment, <clears throat> not had an embarrassment hashtag on them. All right. Not, not only that, it's where did the spotlight go when those weapons were found? That yes. was the big issue is who, in fact, would have been caught under the spotlight. We do know, <clears throat> as you say, that there were weapons of mass destruction. But if you take a look at the entire scenario that was presented to the American people, okay, this was about vehicles that were moving around the country so that they couldn't be found, they couldn't be located. And they were mobile production facilities for gas weapons, for, um, you know, for uh, biological weapons, for, and that in, in, spe in specific circumstances, the enrichment of uranium for atom bombs, because they were way too, um, I would say, they didn't have the technology for nuclear weapons, barely had the technology at that point for an atomic weapon. So these were the things they were telling us that they had, while you were, in fact, were finding the things that were there all along and were provided by the US, by US companies um, at the time that Saddam Hussein was in fact a CIA asset. Yes, that's absolutely correct. <clears throat> and so we have weapons of mass destruction made in the US of A, transported from a company uh, with a sitting president sitting on the board of directors who knew all this, by the way. And then we have also, as I put out the warning, I've been debriefed with the FBI on this whole issue, is yes, they knew, now have nuclear detonators provided by the Los Alamos Research Laboratory, all right? I spoke to the engineer who designed those triggers, and he confirmed everything, including the people who were responsible. Number one, of course, was, as always, George W. Bush. It was one of his chief executive orders, first executive orders, and secondly, Admiral Joseph Lopez, all right, who, who worked for, surprise, Halliburton Logistics. So now we have nuclear weapons capability running around loose in a very unstable country called Iraq. Well, why don't you make the connection here? You can't bring up Halliburton without saying who is he connect who's that who's connected to Halliburton? Who was basically the owner of Halliburton? Yes, the basic Cheney. owner of the Halliburton, of course, was Dick Cheney. Yes. Right? The vice president at the time. Yes. Dick Cheney. Okay. Hopefully I didn't stutter when I said that. All right. And so because I've been over this a, a million times with several agencies, and everybody says, no, 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 this. We can't let this get out. The FBI said this. Oh no, this is so disastrous. We just had, we just took our country to war, and these people who took us to war are making more money than God could make in this situation. All right, and here we are. We're still not out of Iraq. We're still not out of Afghanistan. We're still not out of Guantanamo Bay. All right, and it's escalating. We're we're now going into Syria, Yemen. Somalia. I mean, take your pick. You know, what, what a disaster this thing is. <coughs> so, Greg, let's fast forward to why it was so pertinent to have a special episode today in reference to what is exactly happening right now that can affect the American people and the American soldiers. Because people really don't like to be tortured. And I found out they really detest having their children tortured and murdered. All right. And that's exactly what <clears throat> uh, Donald Trump, the, the POTUS now of, of our country, is attempting to do. It, it, and it's already caused a schism, okay, in, in the appointed cabinet 
They're already arguing about it. So this thing, if it breaks out, and especially, especially in the light of our diminished naval defense capability, we are in a lot of trouble, okay? Uh, uh, we already have the victims of our torture program. They're called ISIS, still demolishing most of the Middle East. And, 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 and don't think that they're being defeated, folks. You know, you've got 5,000 men in Mosul demolishing an army uh, that was raised against them, and they're demolishing that army, all right? And believe me, they are not going to be in the best of moods when they get through uh, destroying the Iraqi army and they're, and they're on the loose, all right? I, now, I, I did read in the Times article that what, what um, Trump is, in, in effect, um, going to be doing uh, or if he promotes this executive order is not necessarily, okay, and this is the way they state it, not necessarily meaning <clears throat> the reinstitution of torture or enhanced interrogation, not necessarily meaning the reopening of these black prisons, not necessarily, not, that is not stated within the executive order, but it merely takes us back on a path that could lead to that. So are you telling me that when, and again, we're talking about the New York Times, I trust them about as much as I do any fool, any idiot, um, which is not very much at all, but they're stating that this could put us back in a scenario that may lead to this happening. Are you saying that you believe this is exactly what's going to happen? Because even the New York Times, if they figured they could pin on Trump that this was going to cause um, the reinstitution of torture, the reinstitution of these prisons, they would be blatantly saying that. But they're stating, there is nothing stating that this is the intent, but it could lead to this being a, I don't know, a fallout of the direction he's tending it. Well, and that's a good question, Roger, because I think a lot of viewers now are questioning everything that's coming through the media. How much is uh, actually true and what is being exaggerated is there a sense of underlying truth to things and what is going to misdirect someone and continue to cause a lot of um, unfortunately uh, challenges that we're facing against each other here in the United States because of the election so I think that's a fantastic mm -hmm. question what are you it seeing? Will. Tell us. Is this a fact or is this a maybe or is this a possibility that may be generated by this executive order? With all due respect, if you don't think that we're going to have a, a major nuclear detonation, you're just whistling past the graveyard. Everyone is. Oh, well, maybe it won't be as dramatic as it was last time. Oh, cut it out. This thing is going to be so overwhelming. And, and like I say, you know, I'm very seldom wrong with my predictions, and if ever, all right, and we have got a major disaster headed our way within the next few weeks, all right, as a result. And then, and then the POTUS states that he's going to re-energize one of the most explosive programs of all time the U.S. has ever created, and, and we don't expect to pay any kind of price for it. Oh, cut it out. We haven't, you know, let's face it. ISIS, just, ISIS is just getting wound up. They're smart, they're tough, and boy, do they have good intelligence, all right? Just ask well, Mr. Lieberman, ask Aren't Mr. we McKinney. supporting them? Aren't we supporting them? Aren't we supporting them? Aren't they getting a lot of their weapons, a lot of their training, a lot of their equipment? Aren't, isn't, isn't this being supported by these very same people that you are demonizing so, I don't know, judiciously here? One, you know, one eight hundred call a terrorist. Okay, that's what you can call ISIS. That's what you can call Al Qaeda. All right. Uh, the the now former CIA director John Brennan. Okay, he was the guy we all knew in the in the intelligence business that stamped the visas of Al Qaeda in Jeddah. All right. <laughs> I you know I don't know what you think about that. And I don't know what the American people think about that, but guess what, folks? We've been supporting Al-Qaeda 
and we've been supporting ISIS from the very beginning, all right? They're ours. They always have been. They take their orders from us. We, we, do, we provide material uh, uh, support. We provide intelligence, transportation. Uh, we provide, I mean, who does anybody think when you have wounded in ISIS, where do they go? You think they die on the battlefield? Oh, no, afraid not, folks. <clears throat> they, you know, they go, they just go west for their medical care. When Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, AKA al Aghassi al-Baghdadi, got shot in the head, uh, what, months ago? Okay, where do you think he went? He went to Israel. 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 Okay. Yep. Yeah, just ask Mr. Lieberman. Just ask Mr. McCain. Ask especially Hillary Clinton, all right? And, and, and who's that, Lindsey Graham, okay? Ask these people how how John the, McCain how was structured. Okay, they supported it. They provide they provided the liaison with the Saudis to support the twelve step process of how to make a new uh, terrorism army that can't be stopped. They All right, we got <clears throat> we got five minutes. Okay, we've got five minutes left of this show. What I'd like you to do, okay, <clears throat> we always always make a serious attempt in this project to give everybody the news, no matter how bad it is, okay? <clears throat> the only news, the only information you cannot protect yourself from is the information you don't have. Eradicating program ignorance, that's what we're all about. So we're telling them about these issues. <clears throat> we're telling them that it's being perpetrated and perpetuated by those who call themselves our leaders. We're telling them that these things are being done in our names, whether they're be being done secretly, overtly, or covertly, okay? We're at the end of our show here, okay? Rebecca, do me a favor, give a wrap up. Greg, then we'll let you give about a, about a 30 second wrap up and we're gonna have to uh, close down E that we're gonna be doing another show at the beginning of February with you, Rebecca, myself, and uh, um, our friend Janice Kapinski again. So um, Rebecca, anything you've got to say here? I just want to thank our viewers again for staying tuned. I want to thank Greg for coming on and giving a lot of the details that many Americans may not be aware of and why it's so pertinent today. So thank you very much, Greg. My pleasure, Rebecca. All I can say at this point for my 30 seconds is this, okay? As of today, when everybody was looking at the, you know, the culture, torture program, guess what? The whistleblower uh, repression acts have stepped into place. Yes, uh, and believe me, Trump saw what Obama did to the whistleblowers, which is basically what I am, okay? And now the, the, our First Amendment rights are about to be crushed, crushed, all right? So I want everybody to realize the danger we are in right now. We haven't, we haven't left the danger zone, folks. We've just moved into another one. Okay, don't forget that. And don't forget where, you, where, where all the, you know, I don't want the listeners to forget where they heard that either. All right. Okay. On your I show, Roger, and thank you for having me. Well, I don't know what's happening, but you seem to be fading off into the gray here. But, but that's okay, because the show is fading to an end. But um, there's, you're, it's hard to see you at this point. You're, it's very that, dark. That is just NSA, Roger. <laughs> no they problem. shut your lights off. All right. I'm used to it. <laughs> for everybody who's listening, um, what you need to understand here and the message we're trying to get across to everybody is that you're only seeing the tip of the iceberg. What the government allows you to see is merely the tip of the iceberg. If you think it matters who sits in the White House, it may matter about bringing jobs back to America. It may matter about how much money the government spends on um, infrastructure programs. It may matter in a lot of things that Trump has promised to do. But when you truthfully believe that everything that goes on under the counter, everything that goes on covertly is not going to continue in much the same fashion as it has been perpetrated and perpetuated for the last several decades, then you're seriously wrong. The only way people like you and myself and uh, our great friend Greg and my phenomenal co-host um, Rebecca can do anything about this is to be aware of it. We need to eradicate the program ignorance that the society has. What's being done in our names is criminal. 
what's being done in our names. No, nobody in this audience would absolutely willingly take part in themselves. We're looking at things that are being done in our name that none of us would support. So let us go forward. Let us continue to eradicate the programmed ignorance. Let us bring you into the light. And as I said earlier in the show, once you're aware of what's going on, if you're still not willing to speak up, don't ever, ever let me hear you say anything when we drag these tyrants into court, when we put these tyrants in prison. Because you know what? You didn't want to have anything to do with it. If you're aware and you choose to do nothing, you're as guilty as those who perpetrate the tyranny. And with that, I'd like to say good night to everybody. Remember, this is TLB TV brought to you by the Liberty Beacon Project. We appreciate you listening. Have a pleasant evening. Thank you both.